towers of pain be cast down in Jesus' name. The rivers of hatred and oceans of shame be tried up in Jesus' name. The fear-filled divisions will all be erased. We claim this in Jesus' name. All tribes and tongues, every culture and race, united in Jesus' name. So we will.
would be washed clean and represented to Jesus as a reward for his suffering. We pray all of this in his mighty and unmatched name. Amen. Hey church, my name is Joshua Ellers. I'm a pastoral assistant here at Pleasant Valley, and I'm going to read the scripture for our sermon today. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16 wash yourselves make yourselves clean remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes cease to do evil learn to do good seek justice correct oppression bring justice to the fatherless plead the widow's cause come now let us reason together says the Lord though your sins are like scarlet they shall be as white as snow Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a just God, that you plead the cause of those who need you, of the fatherless, of those who are oppressed, we know that you are a God of justice, and that's why we ask that you would give us a heart to be like yours, a heart of justice, a heart to listen and to reason with you. We're thankful that you're gracious and you forgive us of our sins. God, help us now to mourn with those who mourn and to weep with those who weep. Teach us to be like you. Give us your heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, y'all, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us online this morning. If you haven't already, if you would just share this so that other friends and family and neighbors can join in with us in hearing God's word today. You know, it is, it is a joyful day in many ways because churches across the country and even some here in Owensboro are beginning to physically gather together again. So as Christians, I think we feel joy. Um, but I think more than that right now, our hearts are heavy. Our hearts are heavy because our nation is filled with division and strife and hurt and pain and tears. And so today we're in week three of our sermon series, Asking for a Friend. And this morning we're wrestling through this question of what is the Christian and what is the biblical response to racial injustice and, and everything that is going on in our country right now? And I want to start here. As Christians, we don't think through this issue of racial uh, injustice first and foremost through a political lens. The politics and the conversation therein is very important, but that's not where we start because we are Christians before we are Americans. And so we can have opinions about uh, the politics of the matter, but we have a biblical authority on the matter. And that authority is God himself. And he has spoken right here in his word. God is not running for office this November. He is already king, and he has already spoken. And so this morning, as I address this subject of racial justice, I'm not speaking as a representative of the left or the right. I'm not speaking as a representative of Fox or CNN News or anybody else. This morning, I'm speaking as an ambassador for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who has spoken emphatically in his word. And so from God's word and under God's authority, I want to make 12 statements this morning 
related to racial justice and all that is going on in our country. And here's the first thing. The first thing is that God created all people in his image and for his glory. And we see this from the very beginning of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then a few verses later in verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God created Asian people. God created uh, Hispanic people. God created black people. God created white people. And he created all of them for his glory. In the United States of America, in our Declaration of Independence, um, the authors were right when they penned that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. And that's exactly right. But God said that all people were created equal long before our founding fathers wrote those sacred words back in 1776, which, friends, means any hint of racism, any hint of prejudice or disrespect towards another group of people because of the color of their skin, not only is it un-American, but first and foremost, it's sin against a holy God who created all people in his image and for his glory. But second, the heart of God from the very beginning of the Bible has been to save for himself a people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. If you want to know the end for which God created the world, you go to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, and you see this glorious throne around, or picture around the throne of Jesus, that after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, all peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I know what we mean sometimes when we say things like, uh, I don't see skin color. I know our intentions are good in saying that. But church, God sees skin color and he loves it. God is glorified in the beautiful diversity that he created because... Each of the thousands of shades of skin colors reflect something otherwise that would be unseen of the image of God. So friends, when we go to heaven someday through Jesus, ethnicity and language and skin color don't get left behind. So we need to love and celebrate now what God will love and celebrate throughout all of eternity. In heaven, white people will be the minority, and English will not be the primary language. And if we can't embrace and celebrate that, then, man, we've got a lot of soul searching and Bible reading and repenting to do before we die. But number three, racial justice is not the gospel but it is a clear outworking of the gospel. So before racial harmony is a sociological or political issue, it's a blood issue. So while the diversity of skin color will remain in heaven, Jesus died to create one race united by his blood. The apostle Paul teaches us this clearly in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. He's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to non-Jews like most of us. People who at one time were not a part of the people of God. And look at what he says in verse 12. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So to those of us who are not Jewish ethnically, at one time we were alienated. We were strangers from God. We were spiritual minorities. And then in verse 13, Paul says, but now in Christ... You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made us both one. That's Jews and Gentiles, but this also applies, friends, to black and white and Asian and Hispanic, to all people. Jesus has made us one, who has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility 
by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that Jesus might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So in America, we ended Jim Crow laws in 1964, but Jesus Christ eradicated spiritual racial segregation 2,000 years ago when he died on a cross. So because of the gospel, Paul says, there's not a Jewish church. Because of the gospel, there's not a Gentile church. There's not a black church. There's not a white church. There's one church, and that is the blood-bought church of Jesus because Jesus overcame oppression by becoming oppressed himself on a tree for the sins of the world, which means, brothers and sisters, any hint of racism, any hint of prejudice, it's not simply anti-human. It's fundamentally anti god gospel. So number four, therefore, a faithful community of God's people is one that pursues justice for all people, for all those people created in the image of God. In Isaiah chapter one, God is displaying his anger against his people because of the sin of injustice, because they weren't defending the rights of the vulnerable, of the oppressed, of the minority. So in Isaiah chapter one, notice What God does in verse 21, he says, The faithful town, what an adulteress she has become. But now he tells us what it means for her to once be faithful. She was, back when she was faithful, she was full of justice. Righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murderers. So God says in his word that what it means to be a faithful community of his people is to be a community that is filled with justice for all people. And there's a lot of talk about justice these days, a lot of talk about social justice and racial justice. But friends, what is biblical justice? Well, I'm just going to quote to you actually from a biblical dictionary. Here's what we read. Biblical justice is order that God seeks to establish in his creation where all people receive the benefits of life with him. As love is for the New Testament, so justice is the central ethic idea of the Old Testament. Justice has two major aspects. First, it is a standard by which penalties are assigned for breaking the obligations of the society. But second, justice is the standard by which the advantages of social life are handed out, including material goods, rights of participation, opportunities, and liberties. Various needy groups are the recipients of justice. These groups include widows, fatherless, resident aliens, who are also called sojourners or strangers, um, wage earners, the poor, and prisoners, slaves, and the sick. So when people had become poor and weak with respect to the rest of the community, they were to be strengthened so they could continue to be effective members of the community. So biblical justice restores people to community. So this is why God says in Isaiah 1, he says, learn to do good. Now, what does it mean to learn to do good, he says? Pursue justice. Then he says, correct the oppressor because a faithful community of God's people all throughout the Bible is a group of people that pursues justice for all people. So number five, as we're in this pursuit of justice as the people of God, we have to remember that two wrongs never make a right. So in our country, we can and should have a place for peaceful protest. But we never bring about justice. We never bring about righteousness through violence, through things like rioting and looting. It is sinful. It is wrong. It is shameful. It does not honor the life and the legacy of George Floyd. Violence never solves problems. It's never God's way. So as Christians, we have to humbly hear and listen to the cries of those in protest. But we cannot and we must not endorse violence and anarchy. But number six, people, rulers, and leaders who don't seek after justice, they are out of step with the will of God. If you go back to Isaiah 1, you see this rebuke of God to leaders. When God's people did not pursue justice and equality for all people, look at what God said about their rulers in verse 23. He said, your rulers are rebels. They are friends of thieves. 
They all love graft and chase after bribes. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless, and the widow's case never comes before them. This is why the New Testament commands us to pray for our leaders. But in particular, we're called to pray for our leaders so that they might make laws and lead the land in such a way that would ensure we have a land that is filled with justice. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1 and 2, look at what the Holy Spirit says. He says, first of all then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all of those who are in authority. Why do we pray for the president? Why do we pray for our governors? Why do we pray for mayors? Why do we pray for people in Congress? Here's why. So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So it is the will of God that regardless of their skin color, people will be able to lead a peaceful, quiet, tranquil life. That is justice. That is the will of God. So an African-American man should be able to jog peacefully and quietly through any neighborhood in America without having to worry about the safety of his own life. That is the will of God. A refugee from Burma or an adopted teenager from China should be able to go to school peacefully and quietly without worrying about other kids making wisecracks of them about the color of their skin. That is the will of God. And here's how seriously God takes this, number seven. When God's people don't seek justice for all people, God is angered. Look at the words God uses to describe a people who don't treat all people the same. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4, he says, O sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on God. So to turn our backs on other people made in the image of God is to turn our backs on God himself. And this is why number eight, religion without justice for all people is worthless to God. And it's not true religion at all. In Isaiah chapter one, verse 13, notice what God says to a people who don't seek justice, to a people that are okay with oppression and inequality. He says, stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. I hate your new moons and your prescribed festivals. They become a burden to me. I'm tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you even if you offer countless prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Friends, we may not completely understand But if we don't at least seek to hear and listen to the cries of our brothers and sisters of color right now, God may not hear our cries in prayer. God hates religion that lacks mercy and compassion for all people. This is why Jesus himself said in Matthew 23, He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. That's a pronouncement of judgment. Judgment upon you, hypocrites, because you pay a tenth. You tithe, mint and dill and all these things, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. What is more important than tithing? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Jesus says, you can go to church We can give our tithes and offerings. But if there is disdain in our heart for other people who are created in the image of God, we may indeed be religious, but we cannot claim the religion of Christianity. And this is why God says in Isaiah 1, learn to do good, pursue justice. Now, how do we do that? Well, number nine, Christians are called to weep with those who are weeping. This is how we pursue justice in some sense. When thinking about her own people and what they so often experienced, one black sister in Christ wrote these words. She said, I want to be mad, but I have no anger left. 
I want to cry and my eyes well up, but I don't even have any tears left to shed. All I have left is mourning. And I don't even know how much of that I have left. When God speaks a word of response to that sister in Christ, he speaks a word of response to all of us who hear her tears. And the word in Romans 13, 15 is we rejoice with those who rejoice, but then God says you weep with those who weep. Now, it's just as important to notice what God does not say there. What God does not say in his word is only weep with those who are weeping after we've done a thorough analysis of all the statistics and we determine whether or not we think their weeping is legitimized. No, God doesn't say any of that. God just says, weep with those who are weeping. As one older black couple told me with tears in their eyes, they were recounting to me when they were children. They were children in the deep south, and they recounted in detail how um, they were not allowed to drink out of the same water fountain as the white kids. And if that still makes them sad, we weep with them. One black physician shared with me how when he walked down the hallways of med school, that multiple times over the years, on a regular basis, he was asked to take out the trash or go fix a toilet because they assumed he was a janitor, not a medical student, because of the color of his skin. And as that makes him sad to reflect upon it, We weep with him. Because as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, when when one member of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer. And that's why number 10, as Christians, think through the issue of racial justice. Godly wisdom says we should spend less time correcting people and more time connecting with people. When was the last time we were willing to have an honest conversation about race without becoming defensive? I want to ask that question again. When was the last time we were willing to have an honest, open conversation about race without becoming defensive? Here's what God says. James 3, 17. God says, the wisdom from above, that's godly wisdom. This is what we want, God's wisdom, not earthly wisdom, godly wisdom. How do you know if you're wise in God's eyes? The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. If we're not even open to a conversation about prejudice or racism, if we're not even open to reason and open to hearing other people out and how they feel, the Bible says we don't have godly wisdom. For in Scripture, the opposite of wisdom is foolishness. This is why the Proverbs say, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding but only in expressing his own opinion. Friends, maybe the most God-honoring thing we can do when it comes to this issue of racial justice is to talk a lot less and to listen a lot more. Less correcting, more connecting. Which means, number 11, when necessary, we must repent. When necessary, we must repent. God's solution to the people of Judah who did not seek out justice for all people, his solution wasn't primarily social or political reform. God's solution is repentance. Isaiah 127, Zion will be redeemed by justice those who repent by righteousness. You know, I know this message lands differently on all of us. 
if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. But sometimes we don't know if the shoe fits because many of us are not even willing to try it on. For some, maybe for the first time in our lives, we need to have an honest conversation with God. We need to get off the internet and on our knees and talk to God and and pray like the psalmist prayed in Psalm 139. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. God, see if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Friends, we've all got stuff inside of us. It's there because we're humans. We believe in total depravity. (laughs) We believe in the doctrine of sin. And if we really believe in the doctrine of sin, we are far more sinful than we are willing to admit or acknowledge. Friends, if you have an honest conversation with the Holy Spirit, he may show us some ugly in us that we didn't even know was there. It's a good time for us to ask that to the Lord which means number 12, and in conclusion, we must pray. We must pray. Our land is broken. Our country is in chaos. Our hope is in no politician. Our hope is only in Jesus. Our hope is that heaven would come down and that God would wreck hearts, bring about peace and unity and righteousness in only a way that he can. So, friends, would you join me at this time, and let's pray, and let's go before the Lord and plead with him to give grace and mercy to our land. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And, Lord, our hearts are heavy. Our hearts are broken. Our hearts are sad. Our hearts are confused. Our hearts are frustrated. Father, we're keenly aware in this season that there's nothing we can do to fix the problem. Father, we need heaven to come down. So, oh God, would you in your mercy send your Holy Spirit and bring healing to our land that only comes through the blood of Jesus. Jesus, you shed your blood to make the two one. You have eradicated by the cross the dividing wall of hostility. Oh God, would you come and make us one under the blood of Jesus. Father, would you allow us to be a people who weep with those who are weeping. Father, would you bring mercy, would you bring justice to our land? Or that all men and women and boys and girls, regardless of which side of the tracks they come from, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their uh, skin color, regardless of how much money they make, God, may we be a land of mercy and justice. As Lord, we long for the new heavens and the new earth. Father, may we be a a church who doesn't just preach the gospel, but a church who lives out the gospel as we strive together to pursue love and peace and unity and justice for all people. In Jesus' name, amen.
defense against the dark, hard world is the fortress that is Christ. And so we look to him as we sing this song. And even though the world may come against us, even as we stand up for injustice in our cities and in our lives, even if the world comes against us, we have this confidence that Christ is with us. He's a strong fortress. He's with us and he sustains his people. Let's sing.
strength confide Our striving would be loose 